Welcome back to MCB 170, Society and the Brain. This is lecture 24, which corresponds to part one of module 12. The title of module 12 is The Aging Brain. In module 12, we're discussing the neurobiological, psychological, and sociological aspects of aging, dementia, neurodegeneration, and death. In part one, we focused on neurobiological aspects. In part two, we'll shift to the psychological and sociological aspects of aging. One of the salient sociological aspects of aging is the generation gap. The generation gap is the difference in attitudes between people in different age groups within the same society, within the same culture. These differences in attitudes can lead to misunderstandings. Also, norms and rules and laws that favor older people can also lead to resentments and misunderstandings between individuals in different age groups. Perhaps a good example is the social security system of the United States government. The social security system is essentially a government pension system. Through the social security system, the government makes pension payments. It sends pension checks to retired American citizens. How does the US federal government fund the social security system? Through taxes? No. People who work are required by law to contribute a portion of their salary into the social security system. Does the, does the, does the federal government then save those contributions for the individual who makes them? No. The federal government takes those contributions and immediately transfers them to retired individuals. What happens when the working individuals then retire? Well, then their pension is paid by younger individuals who are currently working. So you could say that a lot of older people aren't worried about overpopulation. They just want to make sure that there's enough young working people around to pay their pensions when they retire. Generally speaking, the norms, rules, and laws in a society are made by older people. So older people make norms, rules, and laws that favor older people, not surprisingly. So in many societies, older people are at an advantage relative to younger people. And this leads to the question, should the old make way for the young? Should the old step aside, retire, uh, consume fewer resources to make more resources available to young people. This idea isn't new. It may have been around for a long time, and it may be reflected in certain fairy tales that come down to us in Western society from the Middle Ages. Here's an example of a fairy tale, the Hansel and Gretel story. This will be familiar to people in the West, in North America and Europe, because the fairy tales come from Europe in the Middle Ages. They'll be less familiar to people from um, Eastern countries. So I'll go through this story very briefly. Hansel and Gretel are the children of a poor woodcutter. Their biological mother dies and their father remarries and their evil stepmother convinces the father to abandon the children in the woods. So Han Hansel and Gretel wander around in the woods until they come across a house made of gingerbread and ca other candy. This gingerbread house is owned by an evil old witch who lures the two children inside with goodies. But she has bad intentions. She drops Hansel in a cage and forces Gretel to do housework. The, the witch then feeds Hansel lots of food with the intention of fattening him up and eventually eating him. So one terrible day, the witch turns on her oven with the intention of roasting Hansel, but Gretel kicks the witch into the oven and she burns to ashes. The children are then free to eat all the gingerbread and candy that they want, and they also find some valuable gold coins. They eventually find their way home and are met by their ecstatic father, who 
who tells him that his evil wife, their evil stepmother, is dead. The children give the coins to their father, and they all live happily ever after. How's that for a fairy tale? And so we can ask ourselves, does this fairy tale have meaning? Maybe it was just meant as a form of entertainment. It's kind of an engaging story involving witches and cannibalism and evil stepmothers and valuable gold coins. But it's possible that these fairy tales have a deeper meaning. So much of our stories have a deeper meaning. Why wouldn't fairy tales? A brutal Bruno Bettelheim was an Austrian psychologist who interpreted fairy tales. And he took a Freudian perspective. And he thought that Hansel and Gretel were just unwilling to leave the nest. Later on, folklorists, including Eugene Weber, thought that Bettelheim was full of baloney. Weber thought that the circumstances of the Hansel and Gretel story were common during the time when the story was current. He pointed out that hunger, stepmothers, and abandoned children were not uncommon. So he thought that the fairy tales, possibly in addition to their entertainment role, just helped people deal with the harsh realities of their time. Folklorist Jack Sipes takes us a step further. He suggests that, that fairy tales might have served as morality plays. Fairy tales might have had moral and ethical content. Many of our stories have that today. Zipe suggested that in addition to serving an entertainment role, fairy tales may also have served an instructive role. And it's even possible that stories like Hansel and Gretel may have served as moral admonishments, specifically against sustaining the old at the expense of the young. I, I put may in italics here because this is a speculation. We have no way of knowing if fairy tales deliberately served as, ad, as admonishments against sustaining the old at the expense of the young, but it's possible. It's possible that certain fairy tales, which are full of evil old witches, serve to warn young people against exploitation by the old and to admonish the old not to unfairly take advantage of the young. And this idea that the old should not exploit the young is prevalent today. Bioethicists, including John Hardwig, even suggest that we have a duty to die when we meet one or more of these seven conditions. For example, he says, we have a duty to die when continue, continuing to live will impose significant burdens on our loved ones. In other words, if we get old then we're unfairly burdening younger people, depriving them of their, their livelihood, we have a duty to die. This is a rather dreadful list of conditions here. I'll point out this one also. We have a duty to die when the part of us that is loved will soon be gone or seriously compromised. I think what he's trying to tell us here is that if we are aware of the onset in ourselves of dementia, that we're going to become demented and lose our memories and lose our controlled processes and essentially become other than what we were, that we have a duty to die. So if you meet one or more of these criteria, could you work with a doctor to kill yourself? In the US, physician-assisted suicide is legal in California, Colorado, District of Columbia, Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, Oregon, Vermont, and the state of Washington. Could a doctor in one of these states or this district help you kill yourself if you met one of John Hardwig's seven criteria? No, 
Absolutely not. In all of these states and this district, physicians can only help an individual kill themselves if at least two physicians confirm that that individual is, is terminally ill and is within six months of death and that that individual is experiencing unbearable pain or hardship. So no, you could not get a doctor to help you kill yourself if you met one of John Hardwick's seven criteria in the United States. You can only participate in physician-assisted suicide if you're within six months of dying anyway and you're experiencing intolerable pain and suffering. And then what happens? What happens after you die? Is there life after death? Here's a very interesting graph that shows the percentage of people who believe in life after death, believe in some form of afterlife. It's a very interesting list. It's fun to go down the list of countries here from those who believe most in life after death, people in the US, down to the least hungry of the, of the countries that were examined in this study. Generally speaking, the more religious influence a culture has, the more likely people are to believe in life after death. But belief in life after death isn't new. There's good evidence that even the Neanderthals believed in life after death. The, the Neanderthals, as you probably know, are hominids, human-like people. Maybe they were considered human. They're probably not, they probably, well, they're extinct now. They probably were not a separate species. They were probably just another breed of human being. Why do we say that? Because it's clear, genetic evidence clearly shows that Homo sapiens, us, and Neanderthals interbred because many people alive today, especially people in Europe and Asia, have some Neanderthal genes. So the Neanderthals were people and they buried their dead. I like this drawing a lot. It shows three Neanderthals, I think two males and a female, burying a loved one, covering this, in this, this corpse with rocks and dirt. But they also place in the grave food and flowers and valuables to help the person in the afterlife. They obviously believed in an afterlife. And what strikes me about this drawing is the tenderness of the Neanderthals who are burying their loved one. It seems that they're doing it not only for the benefit of the dead person, but maybe for their own benefit. Maybe this burial ritual helped living Neanderthals cope with the death of one among them. And funerals today do the same. Funerals are for the living. They're to help the living grieve with the loss of someone important to them. Many psychologists have studied how people cope with death. According to Doka, there are three spiritual tasks for those who are dying. One, to find meaning in or the ultimate significance of life. Meaning and significance often come up in discussions of death and dying. People who are dying want to be assured that their life had meaning, that their life had significance, that it meant something, that they counted. Two, to die an appropriate death consistent with one's values. We've been talking about values all semester long. Values also come up often in discussions of death and dying. People fall back on their values. They want to believe that their life had value and that they will die in a way that's consistent with their values. Three, to transcend death, the reassurance of immortality. People want to feel that they are immortal. Well, most people know that they're not, their body isn't going to live forever. But many people, if not most, when they approach the end of their lives, want to feel that they will somehow transcend death, that they will have some reassurance of immortality, 
that something of them will continue on after they're dead. This reassurance of immortality can come from religious doctrine, spiritual insights, or acknowledgement that of one's good deeds. So words, beautiful, meaningful words like meaning, significance, values, transcendence, and immortality come up over and over again in discussions of end of life. We emphasize these things, these, these amazing higher concepts when we approach the end of our lives. Woody Allen wasn't a philosopher. Woody Allen is a comedian and a movie maker. Um, his first movie came out in 1965. Now he's in his 90s, and he still makes about one movie per year. Some of them are pretty funny. When I talk about Woody Allen, most of the students don't know who I'm talking about. I think he's more important for people than my generation, even though he's still active. And he was a pretty funny guy and pretty famous. And he's in Europe right now. And somewhere in Europe, they actually made a statue of him. And the statue is obviously going to live on after Woody Allen. But in the context of death and dying, Woody Allen said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. Ha, ha, ha. Well, unfortunately, he doesn't have that option. Um, we're all going to die. And we're all going to have to face our own death. And we're going to have to face the death of people that we love. And I'm certain that everyone listening now has had to face uh, the death of, of someone who they love very much. And doing that is not easy. Robert Marone is another psychologist who has examined cognitive accommodation strategies during the process of mourning for others or dying oneself. So he was interested not only in, in, in how a dying person deals with their own death, but with how those left behind, those grieving, deal with their grief. And one of the um, concepts he stresses is meaning. Not just meaning, but a rediscovery of meaning or a re-ascribing of meaning. And Marone basically separates religious people from non-religious people. And he notes that there are specific ways in which people can rediscover meaning. They can include belief in traditional religious doctrine or the afterlife, reincarnation, or philanthropy or spiritual order to the universe. So there are various ways that people rediscover meaning in their lives. They might get to the end of their lives and realize that the things they thought were meaningful before aren't meaningful anymore as they actually face death. They're finding meaning in other things. Maybe a meaning they didn't know was there, but that's helping them in the process of accepting their mortality. But Marone notes that the specific ways in which people rediscover meaning may be less important than the process itself. In other words, says Marone, in the midst of dealing with profound loss in our lives, the ability to reascribe meaning to a changed world through spiritual transformation, religious conversion, or existential change, maybe for more temporal or secularly oriented people, may be more significant than the specific content by which that need is filled. So according to Marone, one of the things that pretty much everybody needs to do as they face their own death, or when they grieve the, the loss of another person, is to find meaning in that life, their own life or the life of their loved one. What did it mean? What was its significance? And they can find that meaning through some people through religion or through some other spirituality, but for other people who aren't religious, or necessarily spiritual through some sort of existential change, some sort of cultural value. So religion can help. It depends on the individual. Here's an interesting study by Ross and Polio who examined the meaning of death 
of a loved one. So this is grieving for a loved one, as held by each of 26 individuals, roughly split into two groups, church members and non-church graduate students in psychology. They found that the members of church groups appeared to have an easier time accepting thoughts of death and viewed death more frequently as a transformation of life's meanings. The non-church participants viewed death more frequently as a barrier understanding of life's meanings. So in this particular experiment, in this particular case, the religious people had a religious framework within which to deal with their feelings of grief. People without a religious background didn't have that in this particular study. But this doesn't mean religion works for everybody. In fact, it doesn't work for everybody, and it can actually be a hindrance for a lot of people. Here's another study by Petit, who looked at terminally ill cancer patients, and he found several problems for the dying that are actually posed by religion. Loss of religious support from the congregation or from a particular minister is one factor, which is easy to understand. Imagine that you're a member of a religious community and you help others grieve. You bring meatloaf to the families of the bereaved only to find that when you're dying, no one's willing to help you. That can be pretty distressing. Another problem is pressure from a spouse or friend or minister to adopt a different religious position. Here's a person trying to reascribe meaning to their lives and other people are, who don't really understand what they're going through are trying to coerce them into some particular religious view. Another problem is conflict, stemming from belief that God is punishing them for their sins, that they're dying because they were bad. And the final problem they identified is obsessive preoccupation with religious spiritual questions. So the process of dying or of grieving for a loved one is really, really difficult. And it involves meaning, values, transcendence of finitude, some sort of immortality. And coming to grips with that is very difficult. And sometimes religion can be a hindrance and not a help. Bear in mind also, bear in mind also, that a lot of elderly people who are facing this difficult task of reascribing meaning to their lives are demented. It can be a terrible torment to try to cognitively cope, accommodate yourself to death, but you don't have the cognitive ability to do it. Another concept important to Marone, as it is to other psychologists who studied accommodation to death and dying, is immortality. Again, this is not literal immortality. I think people understand, most people understand that their body does not live on. Marone calls this symbolic immortality. It's not literal immortality, it's a symbolic immortality. It's something less tangible that lives on after the individual dies. Again, Marone distinguishes between religious people and non-religious people. Non-religious people would have a more temporal or secular orientation. For religious people, symbolic immortality is often related to the concept of a soul, which either returns to its pre-existent state, maybe it goes to an afterlife, maybe it's reincarnated in another body, or is united with the cosmos. For the person whose primary orientation is temporal or secular and not religious, symbolic immortality is achieved by being remembered, by creating something that remains useful to others, or by being part of a cause that continues after the individual's death. In both cases, whether religious or temporal, secular, this symbolic immortality involves values. For religious people, the values might be religious values or belief in the supernatural. For people with a more temporal or secular orientation, the values may be more cultural. 
But in both cases, the values provide a spiritual or infinite cognitive framework that transcends the finite individual. So through our belief systems, through our value systems that embody our moral values and ethical principles that guide us through our life, through that same set of values, or maybe a different set of values, through some set of values, some belief system, some value system, we can see ourselves, see our life in a larger context. It provides a cognitive framework or a context within which we can try to conceive of our lives and to see our lives as having meaning and, and, and significance. But all of this may be unnecessary. Certain physicists, here's a picture of a physicist, promote the concept of the space-time continuum According to certain physicists, time really is an illusion. That in reality, existence can be conceived of as a unimaginably large loaf of bread, where each slice of the loaf is every piece, every place in the universe. And the slices are ordered according to time receding backward into the future to negative infinity and forward into the future to positive infinity. That time is, the passage of time is an illusion. We're bound somehow in time. It's physically difficult, maybe not impossible, but physically very difficult for us to move through time. We're stuck in time, but that's only our, a problem of our limitations. That in reality, Existence is, takes the form of a space-time continuum. And some folks even think that this claim, which is supported by physics, is mentioned in the Bible in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15. It says, that which hath been is now, and that, that which hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In other words, God or the supernatural being, everything already happened. It's like all of reality is on a DVD and you can fast forward or reverse and go to any part of the DVD that you want at will. That's to God or the supernatural being who somehow might conceivably exist outside of the space-time continuum and has access to any place and time in the space-time continuum. I guess what this kind of says is that whatever you do counts automatically because it's always part of forever. And that might provide solace to some people. Or it might not. Religion or spiritual belief might provide solace to some people facing death or it might not. Culture might provide solace to people facing death. This is an idea promoted by, oops. How'd that happen? This is an idea promoted by the philosopher Peng Chia, who sees culture as the process and realm of the transcendence of finitude in at least two senses. In the more common sense, he says, culture is the inheritable works and accomplishments of earlier generations that endure or live on beyond the finite lifespan of the immortal individual. So essentially, this form of cultural immortality involves our good works, a book that we wrote, a discovery that we made, charitable contributions, working toward a cause, being a moral and ethical individual, providing a good example that can live on beyond us and benefit the world after we die. But in a deeper sense, he says, these inherited works can re-inspirit us, 
which is kind of a way of bringing spirituality into the cultural realm. Why? Because they are objectifications of universally valid norms. Because these norms are not just blindly given by tradition, but need to be rationally justified through time in the face of changing conditions of existence. They can be used to guide us as rational, self-determining beings in our, our activity of remaking ourselves and the world. Whew. That's some pretty heavy philosophy, which you can read it, you can read it at your leisure, because this article is available to you as U of I students for free download from Google Scholar. I think this rich philosophical statement should be interpreted by each individual. But I can try to guess what he's saying. I think what he's saying is that the inherited works are not just taken up unchanged. They aren't static. They somehow reflect universally valid norms or they're, they're, in, they're moving us in the right direction that in some sense, we're looking for universally valid norms. In some sense, humanity is trying to discover the truth, the true meaning of life. And we're not there yet. Maybe we never get there. But I think what Ping Xia is saying is that we can feel a sense of transcendence of finitude, a sense of symbolic immortality. If what we have done, whether academically, scientifically, commercially, uh, morally and ethically, if what we have done somehow enables the next generation, the living, to get further to these universal truths, to, to discovering the, the, uh, the ultimate meaning and significance of life. And we can also see this in the framework that we've been developing throughout the course the idea that the, the brain can be divided into controlled processes and automatic processes. Automatic processes are largely instinctual, instinctive, although they are modulated by experience in an automatic kind of way. And they are controlled by our controlled processes, which are guided by the moral values and ethical principles that we download from culture, whether it's religious culture or secular culture. For most people, it's both. Well, for a lot of people, it's both. But the interesting thing about this view is that culture is created by brains. Brains create culture, but then they download morals and values, morals and ethical values from culture back into their brains. So to a large extent, I think Peng Chia is saying, we can achieve symbolic immortality by con contributing something valuable to the culture that brains who come after us then download and through that can improve their own lives and move their own lives forward. I'll end there. <laughs>